Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 22. We're um, continuing our study today. Um, I entitled this message, Stubborn as a Mule. And I have to tell you, when I was uh, growing up, one of the things my parents would tell me that I used to do, they said that you were like a picky eater. Okay, so that means I wouldn't like certain things. And my mom would often say, what drove me crazy about you is you were the oldest. And so if you got some sort of food and you didn't like it and you said, oh, I'm not going to eat that. Then all the other kids, she said, would fall in line, you know, because you know how they looked up to me. You know, you can tell, you know, yeah, until they grew past me. Right. Um, So anyways, uh, but I would like I didn't like nuts. And so they all didn't like nuts as well, I guess. And I think they all eat nuts today, you know, so they're weird. okay? Um, but anyways, um, so there was this time when uh, I think my parents had finally had enough that, uh, you know, I was picky and I wouldn't eat things. And so. I remember this one day, I think I was about 10 years old, and uh, they decided that uh, they were making squash that day. And I tell you, I looked at that squash, and I smelled that squash, and there was something in me that was like, I'm not eating that, all right? And I I was going to take my stand, okay? And I remember thinking at the time, like, because when I was looking at that, I was like, look, I don't know if I trust these two, you know? Like, they may be trying to get rid of me, you know? Because one thing is, I was the oldest, you know, we had five kids and I was probably the dumbest of us, you know? So I'm thinking, they probably thought, you know, we'll make an example of him. We'll get rid of him. We'll give him this stuff. And so I was concerned about that. So anyway, so they had this squash on my plate. Um, I, I sniffed it and I felt like I was going to, honestly, I felt like I was going to gag. I mean, I was just like, I'm not eating that. And so I was going to take my stand. And then my parents also decided they were going to take their stand as well. And so I remember my mom saying, you're gonna eat the squash. I'm like, I'm not eating that squash. And she's like, you're gonna eat that squash. And she, they would try to put it on my, like they were feeding me like I was a baby, try to put it on my mouth and I'd be like, and then I would start gagging. You know, I'm like, you're about ready to get some other stuff on this plate in a minute, you know, to keep this up. And so, uh, so they, uh, I think things escalated. They were getting more upset with me and I kept going, mm, 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 not eating that. And then I know that eventually, well, if you don't eat this, we're gonna spank you. And I was like, let's do this. You know, I got time. You got time? Let's go ahead, you know? So uh, they gave me a spanking, and uh, they said, you're going to eat this? And I was like, what more you got? Let's go for round two, you know? And I, you know? And so round two came across, and uh, I think things escalated. I think it was with the hand at first, and then, you know, we had this guy in the church, Kiever, who's back in the back, and, you know, he made a paddle for my parents back in the day, a good, thick little paddle. I don't know why he put holes in it. You know, I thought that was merciless. And then uh, my mom put my names on it, you know, so... Uh, so anyways, I think he used to take notches out of that thing. Uh, so anyways, so they spanked me with that and I looked at that food and I just thought, I'm still not eating that food, you know? And I mean, so again, things escalated. I remember my dad finally saying to me, hey, uh, I want you to go out and get a stick. And I'm like, what era are we living in? We gotta go out and get a switch. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even know what that was all about. And so I marched out there and I was like, I'll get a stick, you know? And I saw one of those trees and we had one of those trees, uh, because this is how spiritual I am, okay? You know, I'm like, you know, Jesus had to sacrifice some things, so I might as well too. So I found a tree that had a stick and it had thorns on it, and I brought it in, you know? I was like, that's the way Jesus went down, that's the way I'm going down, you know? That's how spiritual I am, right, you know? So I brought him that stick, and uh, Dad's like, go out and get another one, you know? So I went out and got one. Now listen, I got that switch used on me, which some of you probably think is abuse, but I was like, it changed my mind about what I was gonna eat that day, okay? So... Uh, my stubbornness went out of me and I wasn't gonna do that again. Uh, but I remember t- like afterwards, I remember thinking how ridiculous that whole thing was. And I have to tell you, like if my mom was here today, this is the story that always like, it embarrasses her. Like she's like, what were we thinking? You know, cause she feels so bad about that. You know, and me, I don't even care unless I, I want something from there. I'll be like, oh, it still hurts from when you guys use that stick on me, you know? So, um, but my mom thought too, like, like we were both laughing because we're, we're, we were still stubborn on either side. And at the end of the day, it, it really wasn't that big of a deal. And so when I was preparing this message today, I thought to myself, like the, the whole idea, because there was a donkey and stuff. And so I thought this whole idea of like, man, stubborn as a mule 
is kind of what I felt like in that situation, you know. And, and I'm amazed in life how many times that you and I are stubborn as mules. When it's all of a sudden, like God says, like, here's, here's really what I want for you. And you and I don't step into that. And even when God corrects us at times, you and I still don't get it. Even when things are unraveling around us and God says, here's, here's the best I have for you. But man, we're so stubborn. We want our own way so much that we forget to step into what God has for us, which is the best for us. You know? And so I even thought about that term. And I have to tell you, I feel like I know more now than I did in school. You know, I was helping my kid with homework the other day, some math homework. And I have to tell you, like, they have no business giving me homework. All right, because I don't know what I'm doing. I had to look everything up online, okay? Um, but anyways, um, I was looking up this whole idea of like, where did that stubborn the mule concept come from? And here's what I didn't even know. This is how dumb I am, okay? I didn't even know that like a mule is a mix between a horse and a donkey. Like, I just didn't know that. Some of you are like, yeah, you are dumb, okay? But, you know, some of you get those things. But like, when I looked at that, that thing, it was like, it said it's a hybrid of a horse and a donkey and they said there's attributes that are like a horse and then there's attributes that are like a donkey and they said that one of the problem areas is that horses are very smart but they're also very skittish so when something um, gets them nervous or scared they tend to react by running or flighting or getting away from the situation a donkey on the other hand when it's in a situation where it is scared it has this tendency to become very strong and firm and it just kind of stays there. And so what they found is that a, a mule carries kind of both those traits. And so at times it knows when to run, but it also knows when I'm not gonna do it. And so for example, if you, what they, and this is where this term came from is, they would um, pile up these mules with, with stuff that was more than what they wanted to carry and thought it would be, um, a problem for them over time and hurt their bodies. So mules would refuse to move when it was that. So then they would say, well, then you're stubborn as a mule. We get into this passage today and what you're gonna find out is we have a guy by the name of Balaam. And Balaam is basically what I would call a hybrid. So like when we're talking about like a horse and a donkey, what you're gonna find is Balaam's a hybrid. And what I mean by that, and we're gonna get into it in the passage, but Balaam is a hybrid between a prophet, all right, that on one side, he, um, he's a prophet for hire, he's a seer, he knows how to read like animals and he knows how to read nature. And matter of fact, there's a lot of big things that are written about him that are from other places um, that show that this guy was very well known. But when we, you and I look at that, we understand that he's a prophet really by the way of the enemy or the devil. He's a prophet for hire. Then you've got this other side of him that we're gonna get into the story today where he consults God. God speaks to him, the God that we know because they would have followed many other gods. God speaks to him. And then again, his, what you're gonna find out in the story is Balaam is a guy that thinks he can control the gods. He can control what they're gonna do. And so his hybrid place is, I, I am of the enemy and I'm also hearing from God. And in the midst of this, then we have this scene with a donkey who eventually speaks to him. Now, before I lose you, cause you're like, how can a donkey speak? All right, let me tell you this. Um, what I'm amazed is when you and I come across passages like this and we try to reason it out, okay? Because when you and I try to reason it out, what we're doing is we are limiting the power of God. And what I mean by that is if you don't think that God can use a donkey to speak, then you're not gonna get very far into the Bible before you realize that he created the earth in six days. If you can think that he can do that out of nothing, he can surely make a donkey speak. And I know what some of you are thinking, and you're like, well, yeah, and if he can use Pastor Chuck to speak, he can surely use a donkey to speak as well, right? Okay. So in 2 Peter, we're gonna have this view of what the New Testament church thought about Balaam, by the way, all right? So Peter writes a statement showing you that they basically thought he was a wicked, evil person, but then God spoke for him. And let me give you another side note, by the way. It's amazing to me how God can still speak through sinners 
to you and I. God chooses who he wants to use and when he wants to do it. So let's read this passage together um, just for the setup of the rest of it. But it says in um, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, and this is Peter talking about some of the false teachers that are around their time. He says, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for the wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So, and in other words, God used this person to speak and God can use us to speak as well. Let's pray together. Father, um, I wanna ask that you would just be with us in this time as we go through this word. And there is a story that happened a long time ago. It's a historical account of how you were still working to protect the people of Israel. And so as we continue with our study about the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, may we see the way that your hand was working in ways that the Israelites didn't even see. And I pray that we as a people would understand that there are things that you were doing behind the scenes that we can't even understand because you're trying to draw all men and women to you so that we can have that salvation, that protection that only you can provide. As we begin into the word, help us to have eyes that can see, ears that can hear, and a heart that is open to what you want to say to us. I pray if there's anything that I would get wrong in the text today that you would clean it up in the ears of your people so that your voice is the one to hear and not mine. In your name we pray, amen. So here's what I found out first service. This really, this whole sermon should have been three parts. All right, so uh, I realized pretty quick that I couldn't get through it all, and you're gonna find that's true again in this service. Um, But let's go through a little bit of the background again. We're talking about the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And remember, they're doing it for a year, uh, for 40 years. And what had happened is God had said, here's this land that I wanna give you. It's flowing with milk and honey. They, um, they, uh, they were getting to that place where they were gonna come into the land. Moses sent out 12 spies. 10 of them reported back after being there for 40 days. They came back and, repeat, and reported everything that God said is good, but there's this people, we don't think we can overtake them. Two of the spies came back and said, with God, we can do this. The people listened to the other 10. Because of this, God became angry at the people and said, you're not being obedient. I told you I was gonna deliver you. Everything I said is true. You don't want it, then fine, you're not gonna end up there. And he says, for each day that you examine the land, you're gonna have one year of wandering in the wilderness. So they've been wandering for a long time. But now they're coming to a place where God is, most of the people have died off. God is getting ready to bring them back. And, and what they're finding is that Israel is starting to win battles. They're starting to overtake lands. And because they're starting to overtake lands, what's happening is the communities or the countries or the people groups around, they're becoming somewhat afraid of the Israelites because they are, they are big in number and they're winning all these victories. And so what you're finding is that some of the other countries are kind of getting together and they're like, hey, the Israelites, they may be coming after us. Maybe we should go after them instead. All of a sudden we get to the place of Moab, which we're gonna talk about. And this king we read is terrified. So let's get into the text right away. It says Numbers 22, and we're looking at verses one through six says this. The Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you cursed is cursed. All right, so again, we have Balak, who is king of Moab. He hears and sees the Israelites. They're camping right beside him. Here's a crazy thing, by the way. God had already told Moab, I'm not coming in to take you over. So you have nothing to fear. 
But again, when people are setting up camp beside you and they're growing in number and it looks like they're winning victories, you start to get a little nervous. Matter of fact, it says that he was, the phrase that they use in the Hebrew, the word for terrified literally means he was so afraid that he wanted to vomit. I mean, that's how afraid he was. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been times, and, and again, I think some of you will be able to understand this, but there are times when situations come up in life that we are afraid of or we're terrified that I think you and I come to the place where we literally get sick in our stomach. You know, all of a sudden we find out that our, our, our uh, spouse cheated on us. We get this sickness, like, what do I do? How do I come out of this? And how do I react and how to respond? All of a sudden we get word that one of our kids has either cheated in school or he's been disrespectful to a teacher or has been causing problems or got suspended in some way and there's something inside of us that just, you know, it, it just makes us sick to our stomach. Um, some of you might have been like you, you stole from work or you got in trouble for something and, and or you find out some of your family is doing drugs and for whatever reason those moments come across and, and all of a sudden you lose your job and there becomes these moments when we become so afraid because things are out of our control and become so terrified that we start to get sick in our stomach. And that's where Balak was at this time. He was so afraid of what was going on that he became sick. Now, the problem is when you and I get afraid, we have a tendency to respond in sort of the wrong ways. And so I was thinking just like Balak, I think that you and I, what we can understand is this, fear can cause us to lose control. And because we start to lose control, we start acting or responding differently than we normally would. So all of a sudden where some things might not be that big a deal in life, all of a sudden we get very angst about it or get very terrified about it and we're concerned. It was interesting, it says that the people of Israelite camp near, camp near, and just them camping near made them afraid. You know, how many times have somebody camped near you and it causes you to live in a life of fear that we lose control? So for example, let's say your, your, your husband or wife and all of a sudden your spouse starts working with somebody that you think looks pretty good, they're funny, they're intelligent, and because they are camping near them, are in proximity to them, you and I are afraid that what if they start liking them more than they start liking me? And so what happens is you and I start to lose control when we start to accuse and we start to be concerned. And before we know it, we are, we are accusing them of everything and then it's hurting our relationship. And then the thing that we're afraid about, we bring about because of our treatment. We start to lose control. Maybe all of a sudden, um, because uh, somebody is um, close to our kids and we don't like the way that they're acting or the things that might bring to the table or their family. Like you and I get so nervous that we get worried about how is this gonna affect us? And then we start acting irrationally. How many times at work when a new employee is brought in and all of a sudden they start to have a little bit of success or they start to know a little bit of stuff and they've had a little bit more schooling on the stuff or maybe a better education than you and I get nervous because we're afraid like they're gonna take our spot or our place. And so because of that, we start to act irrationally and we start to find ways and things to put them down or pick on them or whatever to, and we wouldn't normally respond that way. And so instead of looking for the good in people, we start looking for the bad in them as well. You see, we come into these situations where in the moment we lose control. And so what happens in his losing control, what he decides, he like looks at Israel and says, man, we can't beat these guys. They're too big. They're too powerful. They're conquering everybody. Like we're weak. And he gives up all hope on his own people and forgets about the promise of God. And he thought, well, these are people who have a God and they believe him. He says, the only way that we can attack them was we have to attack them with our gods as well. And so what he does, he says, let's get Balaam. And again, Balaam has this place where he's known to be a seer and he, he's known to be in control and, and whatever he blesses is blessed and whatever he curses is cursed. And so they call him in and they say, Balaam, look, man, we need you to step in. And so they're not even acting out of the right response. All of a sudden, we're gonna bring somebody else in and we're gonna put a curse on you. 
And church, this is my concern. I think there have been times that you and I have been terrified that instead of speaking truth into somebody, you and I speak a curse. Instead of speaking blessing into somebody, we speak a curse because we're afraid of where they're gonna end up. You know, I think even in the church, you and I do that. You and I get so concerned about what people are gonna be like when they come into the church. We get so concerned about their past or what they're bringing in that you and I get so concerned and instead of speaking blessing and accepting and loving so that we can minister the gospel to them and let God do his work, that you and I, in fact, will curse them and say, you don't belong here. We can do this at our workplaces. We can do this at our homes. We can do this with our family. And it just doesn't go well. And so that's where kind of um, uh, Balak goes when he calls in Balaam. So Balaam is basically this prophet for hires, which you're gonna find out. And Balaam really believed in himself and he was really being an instrument of the devil at this time. So we get into verses seven through 19. It says, the elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them a fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night there, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabites officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country for the Lord refused to let me go with you. So the Moabites officials returned to Balak, refused to let me go with you. So the Moabites officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other officials more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in the palace, I could not do anything great or small, small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now I'll spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. Whew. That's a lot going on, right? So what you have happening is, again, um, Balak says, let's send a bunch of gold because we know that Balaam is a prophet for hire and let's get him to say what we want him to do. Let's get him to put a curse on the people. And so Balaam hears what they're saying. He goes and he begins his stuff. And again, you know that he used to read the nature. He used to read the animals. And all of a sudden he starts having this communication with God and God speaks to him, a sinner, and says to him, don't go with these people. And so here's what's crazy is, is Balaam, who would love to get paid for what he's doing, says, I can't go with you. I can't go curse them. And then they send back more money. They send back more respectable people. And he says, I don't care if you gave me all the gold and the silver. Like, I can't curse because this is what God has told me. Now, you're going to understand this about Balaam later. Balaam is the type of person that when he believes in gods, he believes in many gods. He doesn't make a distinction that one God is higher than the other. But what he does believe, he believes in himself and he believes that he can control the gods and he can get them to do what he wants them to do. And so when he says, I'm going to go back into prayer and, and Balaam's mind is, I'm going to try to get God to do what I want him to do. I didn't say this first service and this could be a whole message in himself, but how many times do you and I do that? Like we make deals with God and we try to be like, well, you know, God, if you do this, then I will be this holy for the rest of my life when you and I have no intention of doing that. We just want God to send the blessing without any resolve from us. And here is what's kind of happening to Balaam. I think Balaam, for all intents and purposes, would have loved to have been paid and would have been loved to provide the curse. And one of the reasons that you know God told him not to go and he didn't want to go because if you go before the king and you say, I'm not going to do what you ask, that doesn't look good. He doesn't know what can happen to him. And I have to tell you, and I think that all of us can come to this place as well, but there can be a tension in telling the truth. You know, how many times have you seen something going on where you knew something was wrong, but you didn't speak up and say anything? I remember a couple coming into my office one time, and uh, there was an adulterous relationship. 
And um, the wife knew something uh, was going on, found her husband out, needed to confront it. Um, that wasn't the thing that was crazy to me. It was in talking to other people and they said, I knew something was going on. And I didn't say anything. And I thought to myself, how stupid. Like you, if you and I see something going on, especially early on, what if you and I would say something that would prevent that from ever happening? Now, people may still go and do something stupid, but you and I have an obligation to go and say something to try to stop it. I don't know how many churches have been torn down because of an adulterous relationship. And people in the church thought something was going on. It seems like they're spending too much time with that one person. It seems like they're laughing. It seems like they're flirting. It seems like they're missing at the same time. And no one ever said anything, staff included. But what would happen if somebody in staff wise would have came in and says, I don't think this is the look you're going for. I don't think this is what you want to step into. What would have happened if they would have stepped in earlier? It might have been prevented. I don't know how many times that, you know, you have kids and you're raising them up and all of a sudden you find out things that you had no idea that they were doing at school or you had no idea that they were doing when they're not around you and somebody else knew, but they were afraid to say something. Why? Because they were afraid of how you were going to act or how you were going to respond. So they said nothing. And I think to myself, what if somebody would have told me early on that my kid had an addiction? Maybe if I would have got to them earlier, we could have got this dealt with. But there's a tension in telling the truth. And yet God has put you and I in different places so that we can see that things are going on and that we can confront those issues and we can speak into them. We get into verse 20 and verse 22. And it says, that night God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled the donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. But God, listen to this, but God was angry when he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. So you get this, what's happening in verse 20. Verse 20, God says, go with them. And then it says here in verse 21 and 22, then God gets upset with him for going. And we have a problem with that, right? Like he says, go, but then he's, it's like, okay, God, you got to make up your mind here. You're starting to sound like my wife. You know, she can't, I'm just kidding, you know. But um, I want you to watch what happens. In verse 12, when the word go was used, so he tells them, do not go with them. It's the Hebrew word that is imahem, which this means do not go physically and mentally with them. That's what that word means. And I love that idea and I love that illustration because I think you and I need to understand that there are some places that you and I cannot physically go. There are places that God has said, you cannot physically go there because that will be a problem for you. And so I tell people like, look, if you're struggling with somebody and you feel like that you're gonna get in a fight with them, you may not be able to be around that person right now because it's gonna bring the worst out of you. I've told people that I think I have an addictive personality, so there are certain things that I will not do. I won't put myself around. I physically cannot go there. Why? Because the temptation is too great. I can't drink alcohol. I'm afraid I'll be an alcoholic. Can't do drugs at all, because I figure if I take the first one and run around it, that I'll have a problem with it. Can't gamble. Because I know that if I fall into that, I'll probably start losing my home and everything else because I know that I have sort of that addictive personality. So I can't go into those moments. I can't physically put myself there. And there are times when you and I need to listen to the Holy Spirit who will tell us, you can't go there. You can't be in that situation right now. Some of you will be all fired up about a situation. You can't go there because you're not in the right mind. So God cannot have you there. And then we all know that the mental thing is even stronger. Well, now we get into verse 20, and I want you to read what changes. God says to him, go with them. And this is the word Edom, which in Hebrew means you can go physically, but not mentally. In other words, I'm going to allow you to go, but mentally, I want you, and he says this to him, only do and say what I tell you to do and what I tell you to say. That's it. Now, here's the problem. This is why God got mad at him. 
Because in his perception, Balaam thought, okay, God, I'll go. And then I'll convince you to do what I want to do. And here's what I think that all of us need to wrestle with, just like Balaam had to wrestle with. You and I need to wrestle with our intentions. You and I need to wrestle with our intentions. So when I'm going into a situation and I'm going in to confront somebody, am I doing it to help them or am I doing it to help myself? If I find that a coworker is doing well and all of a sudden I find something out about them, am I going to help the company because I believe this will strengthen or is this just to help myself? Like you and I need to decide what intention I'm going in with. You and I need to judge our intentions even here in the church. When people come in and they don't dress the way we do, when they don't wear the things that we do, when they don't say the things that we do, when they've got a lot of sinning going on in their life, how are you and I going to respond? Because what's your intention? Is your intention to say, this is the way I want church? Or will your intention be, God, whatever you send my way, that's what I'm going to step into. You know, I've been uh, wrestling with a uh, passage here and, and um, um, I was, uh, it was in verse 12 when we're talking about that, about going physically, not mentally. This is just a side note. This is a sermon that I've, I've, I've kind of been working on. It's about the whole physical thing as well. But a lot of people online will quote that Jesus went to this place or he went to this place and that's where he was, you know. And I started, I've been wrestling with this and so I might get this wrong and some of you may have a better understanding of this later and I'm gonna have to talk to some other people afterwards. But I told my wife, this is what I was wrestling with. What I was wrestling with is sometimes people would say stuff like, well, Jesus went to the brothels or he went to this place. And what I'm starting to realize from scripture is that it wasn't necessarily that God went there as much as they came to him. So the lady that was found out in adultery, the prostitute, they came to him. When Jesus went and ate with tax collectors, guess what? Zacchaeus came to him and then he said, I'll go where you want me to go. I want you to understand that you and I have got to create a place here in the church where people can come in with their sin because you came in with your sin. And then you and I need to be a place that says, now let me come to your house. Let's eat, let's fellowship. Let me tell you about the good news of Jesus so that your life can be transformed. Because there's power in that message. There's power in the gospel. You and I need to watch our intentions. Like, are we gonna be a church that is really willing to reach out for the kingdom? Man, I hope so. I hope so. So here's the problem. We got this big, long passage now we gotta get into, okay? There is no way I have time to read this, okay? I've got like three minutes left according to the clock. You probably let me get a little bit longer, but I want you to read that on your own. Let me give you the basis of what happens. So there's an angel standing in the way of the donkey. And uh, the donkey sees it. Balaam does not see it. Uh, the donkey starts to go out of the path a little bit. Um, Balaam gets upset, starts beating the donkey, it says, and gets him on the right path. And then the donkey still sees the angel and it's in a walled place where there's walls on both sides. And now the donkey puts Balaam in such a place that his leg is actually getting crushed. And Balaam again gets upset and starts beating the donkey. And again, the angel is standing there and this time, the donkey just gets all the way down on its belly and just sits there and is not moving. Balaam gets up, starts beating the thing again. And then God gives the donkey the ability to speak. And he's like, hey, why are you doing this? All right. Now, my response would have been, wake up, wake up. Or what did I eat that is messing with my mind right now? You know, I took some bad stuff, right? <laughs> Balaam's response is what? He starts talking to him like this is just normal. Right now, again, this is a guy who has been used to reading sort of the signs and stuff like that. Right. So all of a sudden he's having now a conversation. And the donkey's like, why are you beating me? You know, and, he, and he's like, because you're not going. And, and he's like, well, there's an angel blocking the road. Can't you see that? And then it says all of a sudden his eyes are open. And then God speaks to him and says, look, you can't go down this path. I need to get your attention. I need you to do what I said to do. 
And here's what I want you to understand. This person and his stubbornness, Balaam, who could see all of these things, who could bring down blessings or curses, this seer did not see the angel that was right in front of him. Now, church, there are times when God is doing a work in front of us that because you're so stubborn, you can't even see God move. There are times that God wants to use songs that you don't like because that's not the way you grew up, and yet God wants to use that song. There are some people that have come in my life, to be honest, like I want you to, my, some of my most spiritual moments have been in the church, they've been reading his word, they've been spending time in prayer, they've been hearing a hymn or a song or something. Even this morning we are singing the song, man, I just felt the presence of God in a real and powerful way. But here's the deal. Sometimes in the community with, I'm with, I'm with an outright sinner, God will use them. But some of us in our stubbornness cannot even see the truth because why would God use a sinner like them? Well, if he can use a sinner like you, you can use a sinner like them. This guy that was used to controlling things, controlling gods and getting them to do what he wanted to do, this guy that was in control lost control. He started beating his donkey. And church, you and I will lose our control or lose our place. And for some reason, we think we got to take control. And when we do it, we lose control and it looks bad. And people don't want to be around that. And God is a God of control. In the midst of this greater story, when he's trying to get the people of Israel to obey him, we see this guy fighting with a donkey and God is still telling us today, like, look, I need you to stay in control. I know situations are gonna come in your life and they're gonna be problematic for you, but I need for you to maintain control. And then this guy who was used to speaking and saying all these good things and he could throw down a blessing or he could throw down a curse whenever he wanted to, this speaker could not speak and he had to listen to God. You know, church, James talks about this to us, doesn't he? He tells us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And I know there's some situations that have happened in your life when you want to run in and you want to take control of the situation. Why don't you let God take control of it? Why don't in your slowness, why don't you just ask God to step in and ask him to speak? there are some situations in my life that I would love to take control, but the fact is I can't do it. He has to do it. And so let's do it in his time and his way. Let him speak. At the end of the day, here's what I see. God needs to get our attention to see the tension of our intentions. I mean, God definitely got his attention that day. Donkey started speaking to him. He's God, an angel, and he hears right from him. And then he starts to judge his own intentions. Why are you going here? What do you think you're going to control? And I have to ask you, church, like I have to ask myself, what does God want to do? How does he want to use us? You better start checking your intentions. Do you want to do it to make a name for yourself? Do you want to do it to make a name for God? And are you willing to surrender yourself to him and let him do it in his time? We have to check our intentions. Will you stand with me today, church? Let's pray together. Father, man, you've been so faithful to us. And we think about this historical account that we have in the text. And, and we think about, you know, this craziness of the situation. Yet I think there are times that all of us can find ourselves in similar things when, when we're terrified and things are out of our control. That we, 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 we want to respond in the right way, but for whatever reason, we don't. Help us to pause long enough to say, Lord, like this is your servant. I trust you. I'm listening. Like help me to step into your time and your plan. And Father, if there are some times that you have to say, you know what? I got to punish you a little bit along the way because I got to get your attention. Help us to sit in that. And Lord, if you need to just stop us in our tracks, stop us in our tracks. Because we want to be all about doing your will and not our will. So Father, we love you. We ask that you give us a blessed day, a day filled with your joy day we feel you filled with other people that we can come in contact with and love them in the right ways father thank you for loving us enough for sending your son and for giving us account after account of where you're reaching out to your people 
in all their impatience, that you are still patient to love us and die for us. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. So church, I'm hoping that you will see the truth and speak the truth. See you next week. Again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.